All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for those of you who are with me this morning. I realize this is a super busy time of year for athletics, especially with our winter sports kind of coming to a close, but in the final seasons. And then spring sport is really starting to pick up with practices and trainings and things. So I know that this can be a busy season as most seasons are in athletics, but I thank you for taking the time to meet with me today. I am Cara Miller, your campus dietitian, um, and I have a huge passion for sport and sports nutrition. And so I'm happy to be here with you this morning. Um, I think one of the big things that I find is that fad diets are really popular among even college students. So we know that a lot of um, coaches are in the world, just like dietitians are in the world, just like parents of our athletes are in the world. And so fad diets can be a huge influence, especially after the new year. Um, everyone's kind of looking for a quick fix. They're trying to find the next best thing um, and our athletes can fall into that as well. So I thought this topic for today might be really interesting to cover fad diets and their effect on performance. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing is one or two gals or guys might find a trend intriguing. And so they start talking about it in the locker room. They talk about it in the weight room. Um, and so you might hear little rumblings of it. And those are kind of instances where you may want to bring that to my attention and say, you know, hey, Cara, <laughs> we're talking about vegan. Um, the team wants to go vegan. What do you think? Um, and I would love to set up a time to talk with the team about some of those things and go through the pros and cons. We can even do like little sticky notes. They can write their questions on there and we'll just kind of rapid fire Q&A with the dietitian. Um, I can do that in person if I'm on your campus uh, or I can do that virtually as well. I'll try to make myself accessible in any way that I can. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, as mentioned, I am Cara Miller, your campus dietitian. My contact information is here on the screen, my email, my Instagram account. Um, this phone number is my work cell phone number. So feel free to call or text. You can give that number out to athletes as well. Um, I've also put in the chat um, a little description, some information. I've put the slides in there, a link to the YouTube channel um, in case you have to leave early or you have a coworker who's not on the call. Um, and I've also included a handout on there from the CPSDA, which is um, collegiately really well recognized for their nutrition research in sport and their education materials. So hopefully that's a good handout for you. Um, if anyone comes on late, sometimes you don't see that information in the chat. So I'll be able to post that um, again when we do the Q&A portion of this little presentation. It's only going to be about 20 to 30 minutes, so it shouldn't take too much of your time this morning, but we'll kind of wrap, go through the information um, as best we can, and I'll allow time for questions at the end. Um, while I'm presenting, I actually don't have access to the chat. So if you do have questions, um, please leave them till the end and I'll be able to read that chat box. Then we can get to all your questions. All right, one thing I just want to put up here, I always like to start with some kind of a statistic. So the National Eating Disorder Association, NIDA, um, has a lot of great information on it, but they have a lot of information on dieting as well. And one of the facts that I kind of came across is 35% of college students who tried dieting become obsessed or recurrent dieters. Um, and our college athletes are not immune to this. So just recognizing that probably one in three of your athletes, maybe even more, more in sport are trying to find the next best thing. They're trying to find the edge. They're trying to find a trend that might help them out um, and become better athletes. Some of it's physique and based on um, body weight or body fat percentage. Some of it, like I mentioned earlier, might be like a mom who is, you know, oh, I'm going to do keto for the new year. And the daughter says, well, I guess I could try it too with you, mom. Um, and some, some of those things are happening, even kind of unintentionally maybe impacting their sport. Um, and when we talk about dieting, uh, about 20% of people who are these recurrent dieters can end up developing disordered eating or even a full-blown eating disorder. And we realize that that underfueling in sport can be a really detrimental to their performance, um, but also to their person. Um, our athletes are collegiate athletes, and some of them will make it really big someday, but a lot of them are here in college to learn and do academics. Um, and advance themselves as individuals. And so we have to support that as well. We want to make sure that we're not only fueling the athlete, but fueling the person and taking them as a whole and not just saying, you know, we're treating you like a machine, a robot that can put out great numbers. We want to make sure that we're um, 
uh, working with them as an individual, which when I've worked with all of you in athletic departments across the state of Tennessee, um, when I get on campus, I realize how wonderful you are as coaches. You really invest in the athletes and really make it a priority to do mental and physical well-being as a top priority. So what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to go over a few different fad diets that I hear rumblings about. When I talk with athletes, they're asking me about it. I realize these are not all of them. One of them is like cleanses. We're not going to get into that today. Um, I'm a firm believer that if you're well hydrated and eating good food, that your kidney and liver are the best filters you could ever imagine, um, and they will work properly and no cleanse is needed. But if there are questions like that that we don't address today, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to go over them some of these trends. If I need to look up additional information um, or supporting materials, I'm happy to do that as well. So the fad diets that we're going to cover today are intermittent fasting, ketogenic diet or keto, gluten-free, and vegan. And I realize that some of these can be very well-rounded and we'll talk about that. So some of these are not end all be all, this is a fad diet, never ever do it. But I do have a few red flags and some things that we wanna be watching out for as coaches and trainers, um, especially as me as a dietitian, when I do these diet recalls or we're kind of talking with athletes about some of their food fears or some of their food and nutrition habits and what might be impeding their ability to achieve um, optimal nutrition to achieve that optimal performance. And then we'll talk about what's next. So what are some things that you can look out for as a coach? What resources may you have available to you um, so that we can kind of identify those who may be at risk for some of this fad dieting trends? And then I also want to make sure that I uh, talk about March. I'm going to be covering um, relative energy deficiency in sport, REDS, um, and that's a form of underfueling that can be intentional or unintentional, and we'll be talking about that for our March talk. So what the heck is a fad diet anyway? We all live in diet culture. We see it. We see it on the news. We see it on social media. We see it in the newspaper. However, you're getting any information from the world, the fad diets are sure to be included. Um, and basically what this is, is just a nutrition plan um, that's sold as the best or fastest approach to something. Typically that's weight loss for our athletes that could be getting lean, getting cut, um, decreasing body fat percentage, um, and maybe it's decreasing inflammation. There's a few different things out there, but typically fad diets are in relation to some form of weight or body fat percentage. Um, they propose a temporary solution for a larger problem. And when dieting is stopped, the results are reversed. And we see that over and over. 95% um, of people who go on one of these diets regain the weight or have reversed effects within one to five years for our athletes depending on how long it's sustained that could even be faster i'll talk about a study when we get to the ketogenic portion um, and many fad diets eliminate major food groups and have multiple rules to follow. So these major food groups, when they're eliminated, can cause nutrition deficiencies or areas where they may not be meeting their either carb, fat, protein requirements or their vitamin, mineral requirements. And because there's so many rules, that's where it goes back to kind of that obsessive behavior, kind of um, overthinking it. What is right? What is wrong? Is this good? Is this bad? And that could be language that you even assess as a coach. Um, is the team talking about, oh, you're being so good. You only had chicken with broccoli or, um, oh, I'm going to be bad tonight. I'm going to go out for ice cream with friends. Kind of paying attention to some of that language that the team is using or individual athletes so that might be able to identify, again, anyone who might have some of these food fears or food rules because these diets are not sustainable. And some of them are. We'll talk about that. Like um, vegan, for example, it may be sustainable for some individuals. So that's not, again, a hard, fast rule. But for most of these um, um, these diets are not sustainable, which results in that reversed effect. The first one we're going to talk about is intermittent fasting. And um, I think this one is really interesting. It kind of comes and goes, it seems. Um, it was been popular in like the mid 90s. It kind of came up and then kind of pre-COVID, it kind of came back. It's kind of hanging around a little bit. Um, but intermittent fasting, the idea of it is to restrict eating for certain chunks of time. Typically, that's no eating for 16 hours and then you're allowed to eat for eight hours. So maybe during the course of the day, the only time you're allowed again, food rules, right? To eat food is from 10 a.m. until 6 p.m. That's just one example. 
Um, and what this does, the idea of it, the concept behind it is that it could hurt curb hunger. Um, that idea comes from that a lot of times actually you start getting hungry in the middle of the night and then you kind of just sleep through it and so um, by the time you wake up in the morning some of those hunger cues are silenced and i kind of equate it to an alarm clock um you know when your alarm goes off in the morning you like kind of whack it and it hits snooze right and that's kind of like our hunger it says like hello i'm hungry and you're like no i'm not snooze it's like hello i'm hungry no i'm not snooze eventually that alarm shuts off after what is it like five times of your alarm or something it doesn't keep going um, um, so that's some of those decreasing hunger cues. The other one is to give your stomach rest. And this is an interesting concept because Americans typically do kind of either eat one big meal a day or they snack all day long. And so for some of those individuals who are kind of frequent snackers or eating all day long, this concept could result in some weight loss, right? Because if you're not allowing yourself to eat from after 6 p.m. until all the way in 10 in the morning, that could reduce your total caloric intake because of that. Some people also have the idea that our digestive systems are super messed up and allowing it some rest or time to not eat can reset itself. Um, that is a little bit false. Um, it's kind of skewed information, but I understand kind of where they're coming from. Uh, sometimes, again, if we have people that are eating all day long, just planning, you know, those three meals, two to three snacks can be helpful. And like I mentioned, a lot of people are looking for weight loss as a result of this intermittent fasting. So what could these performance impacts be? Well, they're ignoring some of their internal hunger cues. And we know that a lot of our athletes actually need to eat outside of those hunger cues anyway. Um, some of our big basketball guys, they need to eat, you know, 5,000, 6,000 calories a day. They may not always be hungry to like physically chew and eat another meal. And that's when some of those um, protein shakes or additional sh like smoothies um, or additional snacks might be helpful to get them their nutrition. But if we continually hit snooze on that alarm clock, the athletes also won't know what it feels like to be hungry. And that's one of the things I talk with them about frequently is not everyone gets a gurgly stomach when you're hungry. Maybe you would get a headache. Maybe you get stomach cramping. Um, maybe you feel really tired. Maybe you get irritated and frustrated with your teammates. Those are can all be signs of hunger cues. It also doesn't always allow, allow for fuel timing. So for example, if an athlete gets up and they've got a 6 a.m. practice, I was working with an athlete at one of the schools, they had 6, 6.30 practice, and that's during that fasting time. So they're not allowed to eat, not allowed to eat anything. And they were really dropping off halfway through practice. They just didn't have the energy to complete it. And one of those reasons is not only because they can't eat in the morning, but also because they can't eat at night after 6 p.m. A lot of my early morning athletes I make sure that they have an evening snack. We want to top off those carbohydrate stores so their choo-choo trains are completely full and ready to use for energy in the morning um, when they get up and get going for practice. But because you're not even able to top off those stores in the evening, you come into a workout very depleted on energy. Your carbohydrate stores, your little choo-choo trains are at least half empty, which means you may only make it halfway through practice. Um, if that's later in the day, depending on when these fasts take place, that could very well be during competition time. Um, if you got a cross country meet in the morning and you haven't eaten anything since 6 p.m. the night before, you are not gonna run very well. So kind of keeping these things in mind, um, even from a fuel timing perspective. The other thing that it can lead to is under fueling. We mentioned that actually was one of the goals for a lot of people that go into intermittent fasting is to reduce total energy intake to see a weight result, weight loss result. Um, and so when you decrease your total energy, you can also then not have enough energy to complete a training session. So like I talked about with the specific athlete who comes in for morning practice, they're not getting the best workout from their practice. So because they're not properly fueled, they may only be um, doing a training session at 50 to 70 percent. Well, come game time, you need them to have been completely practiced, right? So that even if they're having a great pregame meal because it's at two o'clock and the game is at five, um, they'll have a great pregame meal, but you actually still might not be training at your best. So the total maximum performance may be decreased, even though they're fueled for the game. Um, I hope that makes sense. We're going to talk about is the keto diet ketogenic this was actually originally um 
discussed as a form of treating seizures for um, individuals who have a seizure disorder. Um, and it does help with that. We actually have a lot of kids when I worked clinical in the hospital, we have um, pediatric clinic and they often put individuals on a ketogenic diet to help reduce the amount of seizures a child would have. Um, the other instance where this diet may be indicated is for deep sea divers. When they resurface, they can get the bends and this really seems to help with that. Outside of those two instances, the ketogenic diet or keto diet um, really is another fad diet. Typically limits carbohydrates to less than 50 grams per day. Again, when we're talking about the athletes, that's a big portion of their plate. Um, but the idea is to reduce total carbohydrates. And when you limit total carbohydrates, that can tend to limit calories and that can help with weight loss. Um, the other thing that a lot of individuals try to do with this is to try to get lean um, or to try to decrease body fat percentage. <clears throat> So in the short term, I mentioned I was going to talk about a study. Um, there was a study on women's soccer players that did a one month ketogenic diet to see if it would impact their body fat percentage. And yes, it did. It decreased their body fat percentage. However, it did not show an increased performance and the results were only done for 30 days following the 30 days body fat percentage returned to pre diet. So again, is this sustainable? At what cost? How are we maybe manipulating metabolism and some of those kinds of things? The more we um, diet over and over, the slower the metabolism gets. And we don't want that. We want that athletes to be able to burn energy at a high efficiency. Um, the other thing that it can do is eliminate those big food groups. So we're eliminating grains, pasta, rice. We're eliminating fruits. We're eliminating dairy. Oftentimes this can be at least half of the performance plate. When we look at those performance plates, their pregame meal, especially or in season meals, half of the plate is carbohydrates. If we eliminate that, they could definitely be under fueling or what they're fueling with is proteins and fats. And the fats are typically not like omega threes or you know fish and olive oil, they are the fatty fats from animal products, high cholesterol, saturated fat, which actually increases inflammation, which is not what we want. So not only are glu glucose stores reduced, but the quantities of foods may change and may impact performance in a negative way. Or for example, think about um, if they're not able to drink milk anymore, they're going to be low on their calcium and vitamin D levels. Um, if they aren't able to eat fruit anymore, and we have tons of athletes that don't like vegetables, um, they might be low on their antioxidants. Again, increasing inflammation, decreasing speed of recovery. Um, limited carb stores for bursts of energy. So again, those choo-choo trains are completely depleted. And that's actually why you see a quick weight loss with the ketogenic diet, because one ounce of those glycogen stores, the choo-choo trains, holds three ounces of water. So you can see for every ounce of glycogen that's just flattened or depleted, you are also losing water with that. So you're also at a little bit of a dehydrated state consistently because you don't hold your water as well. And we know that in that energy metabolism system, we actually need water to turn the wheel, kind of like a water wheel. When you turn it around, you get energy out. And so we need some of that hydration, oxygen, water to be able to help fuel things efficiently. And also we need water to make sure that we're regulating body temperature, um, that we reduce inflammation, that remember I talked about those filters with the kidney and the liver, they don't work as well. Um, so one of the side effects we might see are health consequences. And for anyone with an underlying liver or kidney issue, this can be a very hard diet for them to process with the ketone that are produced um, and we do see high uric acid levels come up. I know when I was in the hospital system I worked in weight management and we did a clinically supervised ketogenic diet and labs were drawn every month and many times individuals uric acid levels would go up or other health consequences would become apparent and they would need to stop the diet um, because it was no longer physically even safe for them to continue let alone it's not sustainable long term. So again, when we see people go off the ketogenic diet, typically within, you know, 
even up just a month, um, a lot of the weight can come back because they replete the glycogen, the water comes back and some weight comes back as well. So um, all important things to keep in mind, but just also remember that a lot of our athletes are trying to do whatever is gonna make them more efficient or decrease their body fat percentage. But again, at what cost? Um, we wanna make sure that we're thinking about them as whole individuals. Gluten-free is another one. Um, this is a big trend everywhere, right? We have more individuals diagnosed with celiac disease. We have more gluten intolerance stated. We also have um, people with gluten-free preference, and some of that's weight-related. Some of that's just, you know, they think it improves their digestive health. I don't feel as bloated. We'll talk about that in a minute, um, but some of these things are legit. We have um, celiac disease, which is a gluten allergy. It's diagnosed clinically. And with that diagnosis, um, there is no treatment other than a lifelong gluten-free diet. So following gluten-free is not only no wheat, but also rye, oats, and barley. Um, so even though, for example, like a beef barley soup might be wheat free, it is not gluten free. So you can see that even as we're traveling for sport, it may be hard to get gluten free products. Um, they are becoming more and more readily available, but um, it's still challenging and it may be limiting for some individuals. So the goal here, a lot of people try to go on gluten free either for weight management and some of them say they want to do it for digestive health. So let's take a little closer look. Um, there may be limited options. Again, if you're traveling, you know, to Timbuktu, Tennessee, <laughs> and they don't have many restaurant options, you might not have gluten-free choices. And if there isn't gluten-free, that athlete might be eating, you know, a lettuce wrap with turkey on it. And that is not enough carbohydrates to sustain them for their performance. Um, what other gluten-free options do they have available? Maybe that's looking at the dining hall options. Do they have kitchen access? Are they preparing any of their own foods? And just because something is gluten-free doesn't mean that it's an healthy option. Sometimes people try to do gluten-free to reduce the refined grains like um, pasta, brownies, cookies. Those are also available in gluten-free pretty readily. So um, just kind of something to keep in mind. And this also may mask some other problems. So when you go gluten-free, you will feel less bloated. Gluten is a grain that makes the bacteria in our belly really happy. So the bacteria eat it up and then they fart. <laughs> sort of strange. So they like toot, 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 it blows up your belly and you're gonna feel a little bit bloated. But to what extent? Do you just feel a little distended or is it like cramping, you're buckling over, it's really uncomfortable? That may impact performance. So it could go either way. But remembering that whole grains are often gluten containing, not all, but many are gluten containing and those whole grains actually help our gut bacteria. They're called prebiotics. So they actually feed our healthy bacteria, which is wonderful. It's gonna help with our digestive health. Um, the other thing that can cause bloating is underfueling. And we will talk about this a little bit more in depth with the March talk when we talk about underfueling and reds. Um, but basically, if you don't lose, use it, you lose it. So if you're underfueling regularly and you're not using your digestive tract, any amount that overextends your stomach can make you feel really bloated. And so it is something to keep in mind when athletes start eliminating um, food after food after food. Oh, I went gluten-free and I feel better. And then a month later, they're like, oh yeah, I also cut out dairy and now I'm not as bloated. And oh yeah, now I'm going to go vegan. And they just keep adding. That's a red flag for me that they're probably under fueling and there may be something else going on. Vegan. This is a big one, right? Um, I am not opposed to vegan. I think there are many individuals who can follow a vegan diet and be very healthy doing that. Vegan diet includes no animal products. So that includes honey. That also includes white refined sugar. Not everyone is that strict, but white refined sugar is refined with bone char. Um, so for example, through the Sodexo labeling system, um, we label only vegan items as no honey and no white sugar either. So one thing is 
Uh, why do people try to go vegan? Well, there's many options. Some of them are looking to add more plants to their diet. Some are looking to help the environment or they have some, you know, kind of moral dilemmas with some of the things that are going on in the treatment of animals, etc. And some people are trying to go vegan to reduce inflammation. Um, and so let's take a look at these just a little bit. So um, performance can be impacted by a vegan diet, but how could that be? What are some of the things? So um, we can follow a vegan diet that can reduce some inflammation, but it depends on how it's done. So again, like we talked about with gluten-free, there are many vegan products out there that are not necessarily better or healthier or more fruit and vegetable containing or more whole grains. They're just labeled as vegan. We've got a lot of like vegan mac and cheeses out there. And again, those are not bad. I'm an all foods included dietitian, but if you're just subbing out regular mac and cheese for vegan mac and cheese, you're not going to see a performance impact. Um, it's probably not going to help you out too much. We really want to be looking at the like more well rounded meals. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to mention while we're on this slide, I have the football play up there. Some people are familiar with Tom Brady. Some people have heard of the Game Changers documentary. Um, but these uh, documentaries and films show that you can be elite and also be a vegan. But that doesn't mean that you have to go vegan in order to be elite. Um, so again, you can be elite and you can follow vegan diet, but that does not mean that in order to become elite, you need to follow a vegan diet. Um, there are ways to do it, but it can be tricky. So again, do athletes have access to a kitchen? Um, are they able to prepare some of their own meals? Do they even know how to cook? Um, many athletes don't know how to cook and they say they're gonna go vegan and then they just buy microwave meals that are vegan. And sometimes those are okay. They can be convenient, but they may not provide the impacts that they're hoping for. Um, many are guided by social media. So we've got a lot of people going on Instagram and so-and-so is going vegan and I'm going to do it too. And they don't know what it means. And so that can lead to some under fueling or low protein intake. You are able to follow a vegan diet and get all of your nutrition. However, it needs to be very intentional. And so for our athletes that are already getting up and just having a granola bar and apple for breakfast, it's not gonna help them to go vegan. We need to make sure that they're not skipping meals, they're not skipping snacks, they create a well-rounded meal, they need to be able to eat a variety of protein sources, nuts and seeds, beans and legumes, and whole grains. All three of those components need to be included as part of a vegan diet to make sure that they're not only getting their protein needs, but also some of their antioxidants to reduce inflammation and their carbohydrate stores. This is probably one of the benefits that is seen with a vegan diet is that when you do it correctly, which again is really hard for college students because they don't even know how to do their laundry, let alone cook and do all the things in menu planning. Um, if it's done correctly, um, you can have lean sources of protein, you know, they're plant-based, so that can be a good option. You do, through those plant-based proteins, have more carbohydrates, which can actually plump up those glycogen stores, and typically lots of fruits and vegetables to decrease inflammation. But keep in mind that um, some of the research is showing too that um, I've had some people say, well, I'm going to go dairy-free because it reduces inflammation. That's actually not true. Um, we've found that if you're having those good sources of milk without as much saturated fat, um, it actually can reduce your inflammation because it has some of those micronutrients. It's higher in your vitamins and minerals um, and those proteins too. So it does not mean, again, that you need to go vegan in order to become elite. So what might be next here? Um, especially from a coaching perspective, I want you to focus on their performance. Um, I know it's common to check weights and we do need to make sure that, you know, athletes are not decreasing 20 pounds during season, but on a week to week basis, we're not going to see it. Um, we might be able to see trends over time, but this should not be a main importance. Um, I want you to focus on performance. Maybe that's speed, maybe it's agility, maybe it's a time test. I don't know what it is, but how is it impacting their performance? Just because someone becomes smaller in their body size does not mean that they will become a more elite athlete either. So um, they don't go one to one. The other thing is to make sure that athletes are following a performance plate, hitting all of their buckets. You should be able to easily say, do you have your color? Do you have your carb? Do you have your protein? You should be able to always fill those three buckets. And if any of them are missing or very limited on options, that can be a red flag. And so 
promotion to self, <laughs> ask the dietitian. Um, if you have anything you need, please reach out. I'm happy to schedule an individual appointment with an athlete. I'm happy to do a team talk if there's kind of a trend or a few questions. Um, I'm happy to meet with coaches or the athletic department, whatever is needed, um, just to kind of clarify some of these things and go over some of the answers. I know um, whenever it was, I guess, one or two years ago when Game Changers came out, I did a couple of presentations on that. How can we help athletes un better understand what is the truth about these documentaries that are meant to persuade us in our thinking? Um, and just remember too, like I mentioned at the very beginning, that coaches and athletes and athletes' parents and even dietitians live in a world filled with diet culture and a lot of trends and a lot of noise telling us what to eat, what not to eat, all the food rules, are you being good, are you being bad? Um, and so some of these like moral value things. And so if we can debunk some of them, it kind of takes some of the pressure off and hopefully helps the athlete to eat a much more well-rounded meal. So we talked about intermittent fasting, we talked about the ketogenic diet, um, gluten-free and vegan, and just what's next. So focus on their performance objectives, not their weight or body fat. Um, I know we can see benefits there, but especially for most of our athletes, we'll get a much better feel based on their performance and what are they eating? We don't need to micromanage. So um, are they filling their plates with the protein, the carb, and the color? And then if you have questions, make sure you reach out to the dietitian. Um, I'm happy to work with you. There probably other dietitians I can refer to if you're curious about what other dietitians think. I'm happy to help there too, but I'm, I'm always available either in person or virtually. Just let me know what you need. So my contact information is at the bottom here, and um, I'm going to take some questions. So let me hop off of this screen and escape. Pull up this. All right, let's see if I can copy and paste, whoops, this back in here. So if you missed at the very beginning, um, I posted in the chat, so feel free to open up the chat. I've got my contact information. I did a copy of the PowerPoint slides. I've got the fad diet confusion um, downloadable resource. It's just a kind of front and back eight and a half by 11 page. And then I also included my YouTube channel. So just as a reminder on March 2nd, same time, 830 Central, 930 Eastern, I will be doing the same topic I mentioned earlier, but I will be talking about under fueling and the relative energy deficiency and sport. Um, so we call that REDS as dietitians, and we can help your athletes kind of understand that. We're um, seeing an uptick for sure over the last year with the high anxiety, a lot of COVID pressures and changes. Um, a lot of people are finding control over their life in the form of um, uh, kind of an energy deficiency or controlling their foods, which can lead to underfueling. So if you have any questions, I'm going to hop around, stay around for a little while. You can type them in the chat. Otherwise, please reach out by email or by phone. I'm happy to help and we will see you on March 2nd. Thank you.